In the fall of 2002, 19-year-old Gemma Houghton moved into her dorm room at the very prestigious University of Manchester. Oh, the pig doesn't look like me? Actually, chat, uh, by the way, I, I did tell everyone that if we, uh, surpass the goal on the, on the pig plushie, I would make a Peta Jones plushie in England to begin her freshman year. Her first couple of months at the school were relatively uneventful. She spent all of her time focusing on her studies, and so she really had not gone out and met any new people. But in early 2003, so about halfway through her freshman year, she was standing outside of her dorm when this boy she had never met before walked up to her and introduced himself. He was this tall, very handsome, very charming guy. He said his name was Ian Redmond. He was a senior at the school, and he in you fact got the lived Jones. Actually, he does got the Peter Jones, Jones fit so right now to introduce himself. Now, Gemma was not looking for a boyfriend, but she was immediately attracted to Ian, and Ian would later say the feeling was mutual. This chance Ooh, encounter would ultimately blossom into a full-fledged romantic relationship, Let's one go. that would ultimately lead to Ian 6 years later proposing to Gemma on Christmas Eve 2009. That same year they got engaged, the couple who had diligently saved money for years and years and years were able to pool their money and buy a house together. It was not a very nice house. It was a fairly beat up cottage in this little town in England that would need a lot of work, but Ian and Gemma were actually very excited to do the work. They looked at this as an opportunity to make the house exactly the way they wanted it, and it was a chance for them to spend some quality time together. So for the next two years, during all of their free time, Ian and Gemma would work on their home, and then Don't finally start. in August of 2011, right before their actual wedding day, they finish the renovation. Their home is done. And so they get married, and then literally right after their wedding, instead of going right into a honeymoon, they just moved right into their dream home that night. Bruh. This is why we'll, this is why we'll never be able to watch. Bruh. We will never be able to watch a video again. Bruh. And so for the next couple of days, the newlyweds got to enjoy being husband and wife for the first time inside of their dream home, and then it was time to go on the honeymoon. In addition to having set aside money for the down payment on their home, the couple had also set aside money for this honeymoon. They wanted it to be an amazing vacation. And so what they decided to do for their honeymoon was to go to Seychelles, which is this island nation in the Indian Ocean, which many say has the most beautiful Seychelles. beaches in the world. So on August 10th, hmm. the couple hops on a plane and they fly to Seychelles. And when they land, they check into the resort, which is this unbelievable Seychelles, place Seychelles at the Seychore? Okay. Overlooks this perfect beach with white sand and crystal clear waters. And then after getting checked in, the couple goes down to a restaurant and they're having a bite to eat. And as they're sitting there, they're probably thinking to themselves, this is going to be the best vacation ever. During the first week of their trip. The so they thought. And little did they know that was the last word they've ever spoke. No, that was the last thought they ever thunk. Couple was very active. I'm trying to add lots of some dramatic tension to this, okay? Going out on different excursions and going to lots of restaurants. They were just all over the place. And so come Tuesday, August 16th, come? which was the start of their second week and final week of this honeymoon, the couple was kind of tired from all the activity. And so they decided they would just have a lazy day at the beach that day. And so the couple grabbed their swimsuits and their towels and their chairs, and they left the resort and headed down to the beach right outside. And then after finding a decent spot on the sand, they set up their chairs and towels, put their stuff down. And Gemma, she laid down on one of the chairs to begin sunbathing. And Ian, he grabbed his fins and his snorkel and he kissed Gemma on the cheek and said he was going to go down to the water and go for a swim. Gemma remembers watching Ian uh -oh. as he walked across the beach and stopped in front of the water uh -oh. and put on his big fins and got a snorkel on and then he kind of awkwardly duck walked his way into the water and Gemma remembers just smiling and laughing to herself watching him awkwardly do this and then thinking to herself how lucky she was to be married to such an amazing guy. She really loved him so much. After Ian uh -oh. had finally gotten into the water and had begun his snorkeling journey, Gemma laid back and began to doze off to sleep. A little while later, though, Gemma suddenly woke up to the sound of what almost sounded like someone sneezing really, really loudly. And so instinctively, she sat up and scanned the water line for her husband, but all she saw were other tourists in the water swimming and snorkeling and uh -oh. doing all sorts of stuff. She couldn't find Ian. And then she heard uh -oh. a male voice calling out for help, and it was coming off to the right towards the top of the beach, pretty far away from her. And she turned, and she saw Ian. 
Ian was about 60 feet off of the sand. So he's well out into the water and he appeared to be kind of hunched forward with his arm kind of in the water and he's waving his shark. other arm in the air. It was like he was stuck on something. And before Gemma could get up and run to him or help him in any way, Ian just begins to scream at the top of his lungs. When Ian began screaming, Jellyfish? there was a surgeon who was also on vacation at this beach who was in a boat near where Ian was. He hears the scream and he boats over to Ian and he and the guy who was in the boat with him managed to pull Ian out of the water to get him on the boat. And Ian is alive and he's conscious, but he is missing his entire left arm. He's missing oh. the majority of his left thigh. And there was oh. a huge chunk missing from his midsection. It would oh. turn out Ian had been attacked by a bull Bruh. shark, one of the most aggressive sharks in the world. That sneezing oh. sound that Gemma had heard that had startled her awake was the sound Ian had made through his snorkel when the shark bit down on him. The surgeon rushed Ian to the shore and pulled him out oh. and got him onto the sand and began trying to save his life. At the same time, Gemma had come running up the beach and she managed to push through the quickly forming crowd and she drops down next to her husband. And Ian at this point is alive and he's conscious. He's very badly hurt, but he's looking up oh. and he's clearly making eye contact with Gemma. And Gemma, she's looking down at her husband and she's making clear eye contact with him. And they don't- This is really why I hate the much. ocean. It was like this horrible moment where all they could do was just be in the moment together. And so during this kind of silent acknowledgement, <clears throat> Ian would ultimately pass away. It would turn out over the past few weeks, there had been a rash of shark attacks at this beach, including one other fatal attack on another tourist. Because shark attacks in Seychelles were so unheard of, they believed this had to be the work of one rogue bull shark. That was the one shark. Yo, what up tallest? How's it going? Uh, we're watching a video about someone who just died from a shark attack how's everybody doing what's up raiders you guys just you guys just missed it shark that was doing all of these attacks and so because this shark had not been captured or killed the country had actually he survived yeah <laughs> ban on swimming at this beach and a few other beaches but for whatever reason the ban had not been communicated you're watching extreme cheapskates on tsl good choice on the tourists and so Gemma and Ian had no idea the water was a dangerous place to be. They just looked out and saw other tourists swimming around and believed it was totally safe, when in reality, it obviously wasn't. Gemma would quickly return to England and she would host her husband's funeral in the same church she and he had been married in. Dude, that's awful. This is aw this is awful. Getting married, going on a honeymoon, and then your husband dying to a shark attack. Again, chat, this is why you fucking hate the ocean, okay? You don't know what's underneath you. You don't know what's underneath. You don't know what's going on down there, you know? What if someone re just grabs my, my, my junk? Like, I don't know what's happening. I hate it. I hate the ocean, dude. Like I don't mind I don't I don't mind like dipping my toes, you know, maybe swimming in the, the shallow end. But when it gets further in and gets deep, fuck that, man. Fuck that. They should have sued the resort. True. Why was there no warnings? 10 days earlier. Before we get into our next story, I want to talk about today's sponsor, Current. Have you ever felt like everyone around I'm sponsored by those guys too. Here, here, in 1986, here's my, 35 here's my card million info, Americans chat. went to see the brand new movie Crocodile this is my card Dundee, info. which was a comedy that Oi! starred this very capable and rugged Australian crocodile hunter who goes to New York City. One of the 35 million Americans who saw this film was a 24-year-old model from Virginia named Ginger Meadows. And after Imagine dying watching Crocodile Dundee. If that's what happens, do an Australian accent. Oi, uh, the folky, no, uh, um, uh, uh, down under, uh, fuck, crook, 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 crocodile, that's it, that's a crocodile, that was a good one. Aussie in the chat here cringing. Why would you cringe? 
cock a day till day. Seeing this film, Ginger felt inspired to actually go to Australia to see it for herself because it looked so amazing in this movie. So a couple of months. Is it bad the only way I can do accents is if I think about a phrase that's like common for that accent? You know what I mean? I can't say, Oi, have a good day. Like, the what? I, I hope you have a fantastic day. Is that, was that? <laughs> like, I always just go back to shrimp on the barbie. You know what I mean? Hey, everyone. I hope you're having a good day. <laughs> you're so bad at accents. You're just fucking jealous because I'm better than you. It's okay. Months later, it's okay. in March of 1987, Ginger, by herself, hops on a plane Please just stop. and flies to you guys Perth, asked a for it. city in Western Australia. You and asked for it. The plan was she would land in Australia and then work odd jobs to make a little bit of cash and then use that cash to fund her travels all over the country. And then at some point, after she was tired of doing that, she would head back to the United States. So she lands in Perth and immediately she sees her first opportunity to make some money. There had been this huge sailing competition in the city leading up to the weekend she arrived there and so she saw all these luxury yachts anchored at all these docks along the coastline and ginger's thinking to herself you know these huge ships they have crews that work on them basically full time maybe one of these boats could use an extra set of hands and so ginger who was very friendly and outgoing she went right down to one of these docks and she the stopped of 87? Front of the very first yacht she saw which was this huge luxury 100 foot yacht and she introduced herself to the captain of this boat and she's you know what was funny i had i had a little bit of a rant on a video about yachts how i think they're kind of like uh you know over the top and stupid and there was a there was a person who literally wrote an essay and got so mad at me that i said uh yachts are, are stupid just let people enjoy things you freaking idiot just because people want to enjoy their lives and go on a vacation i'm so fucking mad at you who, who gets angry about something like that? How dare you complain about it? Oh. That, hey, you know, I was, I was so thrown off by that. I was like, going, And in exchange, I'll work for you. And as it happened, the captain was actually looking for another crew member to assist their chef. And so he said, okay, well, can you cook? And Ginger said, yeah, I'm a great cook. And he said, okay, well, you're hired. You can be the chef's assistant. And so Ginger, she climbs on board and she meets. That's all it takes? Yo, you good cook? Yeah, I'm good, man. All right, let's go. Dude, why can't jobs be like that? Instead of giving a, a whatever they're called, res resumes, just be like, bro, you know how you know how to you know how to cut out a liver? Yeah, man, I've done it twice. All right, you'll be the assistant to the doctor. It's the rest of the five That's a little bit of a jump. including the chef who she'd be working with, and the chef's name was Jane, and those two would become very close. And then shortly after Ginger had come aboard, the captain cast off their lines, and they headed out to sea. Their next stop was going to be New Guinea, <coughs> which was roughly 14 days of travel away. After about a week at sea, the captain realized they were dangerously low on fresh water, and so he decided to take she just a went out on the ocean for a week east and head inland along this the river fuck? system that would bring them to this large freshwater pool which he also knew had this huge waterfall that dumped down into it and so he figured they could go right underneath this waterfall and fill up their jugs with all this fresh water and then head back out and they'd be good so on the morning of march 29th the captain anchored the yacht out at sea near the mouth of this river system and then he lowered the yacht's dinghy which was a smaller more agile boat and once that was in the water he ginger jane and the rest of the crew they hop in this dinghy along with all these large empty water jugs and they begin making their way towards this river. What does this have so to do with the crocodile Dundee? River for a little while and then finally she get they eaten get by a crocodile? huge freshwater pool and right in front of them is this amazing waterfall and everybody is just totally awestruck by this waterfall. It's like a, a gem in the middle of nowhere because they're in very rugged Australia at this point. And so the captain, he brings the dinghy right near the base of the waterfall and one by one they hold up their water jugs and they fill them with fresh water and then they're about Dude. to turn and
if a crocodile like comes down from the fucking waterfall and just like dive bombs them, that would be awesome. Okay, that not awesome as in they might die, but as awesome as in like go back you know, out to mind. sea and get back on their yacht. When the captain thinks to himself, you know what, we've been at sea for seven days straight. It's been very monotonous. Maybe it would be a good thing to stick around here for a little bit longer and maybe even hike up to the top of this waterfall and enjoy the view and kind of enjoy the scenery before That would we be ironically hilarious. And so yeah. he says to his crew, hey, do you guys want to go to the top of this waterfall? And everyone agrees it's a great idea, with the exception of Jane. She did not feel like hiking to the top of this waterfall. She said she would stay down in the dinghy and wait for them. Now, this pool is basically surrounded on all sides by just pure cliff face. There really is no place to land this dinghy. There's no flat surface. You basically have cliffs that go directly into water, and then also you have the river that feeds back out to the ocean. So the captain brings the dinghy right up against the cliff face right next to this waterfall, and he and Ginger and the other okay. crew members not named Jane climb out of the dinghy onto this cliff face, and they begin climbing, literally climbing up this wall towards the top of the Dramatic representation of the crew climbing of the waterfall. Did Fox News do a story on it? waterfall now everyone was able to do it except for ginger she kept slipping on the rocks it was very steep it seemed kind of dangerous and so at some point she abandons the idea and goes back down to the dinghy with jane and the captain and the rest of the crew they continue up towards the top and so as ginger and jane are sitting in the dinghy watching the other crew members making their way up they start feeling a little bit left out and they're like you know what let's try to find an alternate way up to the top of this waterfall and so they begin oh, no. scanning out across this pool at the other cliff kind of surrounding it and it looked like on the very other side of the pool there was uh -oh. a less severe cliff face that maybe they would have an easier time climbing up and so the two women they jump into why? the murky brown water and begin swimming directly across this pool towards this other cliff why are you swimming that that is the worst idea ever don't go in water dumb no, just take the thing. Take the dinghy. And when they make it about a third of the way, yeah. Jane suddenly stops and Ginger notices and turns around and looks at Jane and she's like, what's going on? And Jane would tell her, you know, something just feels off. This doesn't feel right. Let's go back to the dinghy. Let's just forget about this. But Ginger is like, come on, we're so close. Let's just keep going. It'll be awesome once we get to the top of this waterfall. And so Jane, she's totally hesitant, but she says, okay, fine. And they both continue. To Ever swim. heard of and Australian of sudden, wildlife? I know, captain, right? Who is now on top of the waterfall, screaming down to them to get out of the water right now. And they notice he is pointing down at the pool in a direction slightly away from where they were. And so they're looking up at him and they're following his finger down to the part of the pool he's pointing at. And they see there is this tidal wave of water coming towards them. It is a 12 foot long saltwater crocodile that has noticed them and it is charging straight at them. Now, Jane and Ginger knew they were too far Dear away God. from the dinghy to be able to see. Did crocodiles honestly... <clears throat> I feel like they're a little bit scarier than sharks. You know, I feel like crocodiles are a little bit, I don't know, maybe not. Cause sharks, you don't really, you can't really see them coming. I don't know. Swim to it before this crocodile was going to reach them. And so their next best choice was just to turn and That's swim towards the nearest cliff face. Because again, there is no place to get out of the water. There's only cliffs. And so they swim towards this cliff face, which is right on the edge of the bottom of the waterfall. And so water is landing on them and they reach the cliff face and they're trying to climb up and pull themselves out of the water. But there's nowhere to grab onto. It's all totally slick. There's no good handholds. Oh, and so God. all they have is this little ledge that is in the water that they're standing on but they're still halfway into the water and so after they oh, stumble for this. a minute trying to pull themselves out of the water and they realize they can't do it they both just turn around and they lock arms and they look out through the water that's falling down in front of them into the pool and they see this crocodile <clears throat> has followed them and it is now stopped right on the other side of the water that's falling down and it's just staring at them with its mouth wide open 
and the two women are looking at it, they don't know what to do, and the captain and the other crew members, they see what's going on, and they're trying to climb down as fast as they possibly can to try to rescue them, but it's gonna take several minutes at least before they get down to the dinghy, and so Jane and Ginger, they're totally aware of this, and they're just staring at this crocodile, screaming at it, trying to get it to go away, and at some point, the crocodile does just close its mouth and sink below the surface but now they don't know where it is, and this causes Ginger to completely panic, and she lets go of Jane's arm, and she dives into the water off to the right and attempts- Oh no, you idiot! Oh, she almost got out of it too. <clears throat> she could have gotten out of it. Have you never heard of, of don't move? Yeah, you, you never heard of that? It, it, wait, is that a thing with croc- wait. Is that a thing with crocodiles? Is, isn't there like a defense mechanism where... Well, I know dinosaurs. I know that meme. What, what should you never do? What should you never do to add a crocodile? Do not swim. Good one. Do not dangle arm and leg over the river bank or boat in the water. Do not feed crocodiles directly. Should you play dead with the crocodile? Some experts say that while fighting back, you should smack the gator's sensitive snout and try to gouge out the gator's eyes. Attack the sensitive snout and, and definitely do not play dead. Oh. Do not play dead and do not be in their territory. To swim away from the crocodile back over to the boat. But Ginger only made it two strokes before the crocodile suddenly reemerged underneath her and grabbed her by the waist and pulled her under the water. Jane is just standing there watching all of this happen in front of her. She has no idea what to do. The crew is still not down in the dinghy, so she's totally stranded. And she's just oh, staring God. at the area where Ginger has been pulled below the surface. And just seconds after she's been pulled under, the crocodile re-emerges with its head pointed towards Jane. And in its jaws is Ginger. And Ginger's got her arms up over her head. She's wide-eyed. And she's looking right at Jane. And Jane makes eye contact with her, but there's nothing she can do. And she just watched as Ginger again was pulled back under. Uh, and this time, she did not come up again. Ultimately, uh, Jane would be rescued from the ledge. The crew would get down to the dinghy. Uh, they'd swing over. They would pick her up. And then about two days later, they would find what was left of Ginger's remains. It would turn out the captain was well aware of the threat uh, the crocodiles posed in this river. And he had told his crew, Ginger and Jane included, about this threat. And that at no... How the fuck would... What? You're telling me they knew? They knew? At no point should anyone get in this water. But of course, his warning went unheeded. How? Okay. What, what person in the right mind ever in the entire world would hear a captain say, don't go in the water because there's crocodiles potentially in this water? Oh, I just want to go on a quick swim over to the other side just real quick. What? Were they from fucking Florida? <laughs> they probably were. If you Google the words Burning Man and you click on images, you'll see lots of scantily clad and somewhat wild looking people roaming around the Nevada desert on strange looking bikes. And in the background, you'll see all these huge bizarre statues of aliens and robots and animals. And these statues are often draped in more wild looking people or these statues are on fire and these wild looking people are dancing and rejoicing all around the flames. Based on these images, you might think Fucking Burning Man hippies, is just man. some totally weird My substance fueled right? party out in the middle of the desert. And while that is true to some degree, it's not totally accurate. Burning Man is not a party. It's actually an experiment that 70,000 people from all over the world participate in every year. The question this experiment is trying to answer is, can a random segment of the population come together and build a community out of nothing in the middle of nowhere? And can they do it while knowing at the end of Burning Man, which is always nine days long, everything they build, the sculptures, the shelters, everything will be torn down and destroyed and erased from the planet I actually didn't know that never been there in the first place and I didn't know that at all year after year after <clears throat> year the answer to this question is yes 
Yes, they can. As soon as these 70,000 people descend the on this small section of the Nevada desert, they immediately get to work helping each other, building their own sites. I mean, these people largely don't know each other, or in many cases, that's they a don't lot even cooler than I thought language, it would. But they're showing up with this shared desire to build this temporary community. And so they begin seamlessly working together. And while shelters are being stood up all over the. You'd get in trouble with that when Twitter and Reddit users come up. <laughs> place. Yeah, you would Other never have a society when they instruments show Instruments and form impromptu bands, and then the artists of the group will get together and begin building these kind of strange sculptures. And so very quickly, within only a few hours, every year in Burning Man, this plot like the come of sculpture. barren desert turns into this beautiful otherworldly utopia full of totally happy and fulfilled and excited strangers. But in 2017, the utopia that was created at that Burning Man was shattered by one man, and his name was Aaron Joel. In 2017, Ah, Aaron that's my name! Joel okay, my first was name. A tall, handsome, 41 year old free spirit who, from the time he was just a little kid, had this sort of restless energy about him. He always needed to be out doing stuff. He could never sit still. And so, by the Rat time he was old too. enough, he left his family home in Oklahoma and moved out to Oregon and moved into this commune. A commune is a group of people that live together and share their possessions and responsibilities. But shortly after moving in to this commune, Aaron got restless again. This wasn't enough for him and so he left the commune and began traveling all over the united states but after he had basically you know what i hate the aa ron joke you don't know why it's because every single time i'm on the phone with like a, an insurance agent maybe maybe i'm talking to uh, some dude who's gonna fix my bathroom maybe the electrician comes over maybe someone who's like working on something comes over they're like writing down my information uh, what's your name? Oh, my name's Aaron. Oh, like Aaron, right? Yeah. They do it every fucking time, dude. Every time. There's something about, like, like I, I, I guess you would call it normie mindset. Where a joke that honestly was funny the first time you hear it is funny forever. You guys know those people? You know those people who, like, always, uh, like, they find one joke that they thought was funny, and then they'll never get over it. White people, man. <laughs> it's so annoying. Every time, like, I'm on the phone, uh, yeah, my name's Aaron. Oh, yeah, like, a a Ron. Yeah, you, you've seen, you've seen that show, right? You've seen that skit, right? Oh, my God, that's, like, your name. I know! I'm aware! I've been aware since it came out. Shut up. Sorry, someone's someone called me A. A. Ron in the chat and it fucking triggered me, dude. On the phone, yeah. Dude, on the phone, like in person, like it didn't matter. It didn't matter, dude. They'll say it. <clears throat> I hate it. I hate it. Now, now since I mentioned that I hate it. Everyone in my chat is just going to spam that for all existence. I hate, I, I can't even express my frustrations because all you guys are going to do is make it worse. All right. Gone everywhere in the country, he became restless again. And so he left the United States and he went to Nepal and began traveling all over Nepal. And while he was there, he met this wonderful young woman from Switzerland named Ladina, and the two fell madly in love. And then when it was time for Ladina to leave Nepal and go back to her home country, Aaron followed her. And just a couple of years later, in 2014, the pair got married and they bought a house together and settled down in Switzerland. For a time, Aaron Band and Ladina word. were very happy. <clears throat> Their life was very simple and straightforward. They loved each other. They loved Switzerland. But in 2017, Aaron's wanderlust reared its head again. And so he went up to Ladina and he told her that, you know, honey, I just, I need to go out and explore again. I need to go out and be free again. Even if it's just for a couple of days or a week or whatever time it is, I need it. I need it in order to be sane. I don't think Ladina was very pleased about this development. However, she knew her husband and she knew this was to him and to you his know what mental that means? health. And so she said, okay, honey, you know, you <clears throat> just, just the lust for, uh, being a wanderer, you know, like, like going out and doing shit.
do what you have to do. And so Aaron thought about what he was going to do to satiate this desire to go out and be free again, and he settled on attending that year's Burning Man, something he had never done before. So Aaron leaves Switzerland, and he goes back to Oregon in the United States, and he meets up with a very close friend of his named Justin. Justin was actually someone he had lived with in the commune when he was there. And so the two, they link up in Oregon, and from there, they drive in Justin's big van out to Nevada. And when they get to Nevada, they drive out to the Burning Man site, and as they're pulling up, they see thousands and thousands of other vans and tents and all these people that are out setting up and building this community, this utopia. And so right away, Aaron and Justin, they find their spot, they park their van, they begin to build their own site. And then after that, they pulled their bikes out of the van and began biking around, helping other people out, build their sites and build the rest of the community. Okay. And so by that Where does it get bad? Aaron and Justin had made lots of new friends and they were out partying and dancing and singing with total strangers, just totally immersed in the Burning Man experience. That night... I mean, the title is This Statue Will Kill You. Aaron so. would actually turn in early while Justin... Justin would stay up and continue having a good time with the new people he had met. Aaron was just not a night owl. He liked to get a full night's sleep and then get up early and make himself a smoothie and do yoga. And so this was very normal behavior. Justin would later say that he really looked up to Aaron. And in fact, many people that knew Aaron, a -A Aaron? looked up to him. Because Aaron, on the one hand, was a total free spirit that would just kind of go where the wind would blow him. But at the same time, he was very regimented and disciplined. He took great care of himself, both physically and mentally. I and wish I was like wise that. beyond his. I'm years. talking about the regiment and shit. He was incredibly charismatic and very funny, and so people really flocked to him and really idolized him. One of the traditions of Burning Man has to do with its namesake. Towards the end of every Burning Man, he gets they will caught on fire this 40 and dies. Foot tall wooden man effigy, and they will burn it to the ground. Hence the name Burning Man. And so on the night of the so-called man burn, Aaron told Justin that he was not going to turn in early that night, that instead he was going to stay up and watch the spectacle of this effigy being burned to the ground. Justin was really excited about it, and so was Aaron. And so that evening, Aaron and Justin met up with their new friends they had met while they were at Burning Man, and their group began making their way over to the wooden man effigy. Did they turn it into now, a more literal effigy thing? Situated Burning Man? Huge Smile? open clearing, and then standing all around this wooden man are what they called rangers. They're basically security guards for the event that also have some fire training, and they would stand almost shoulder to shoulder or very close to shoulder to shoulder, facing away from the effigy, forming a perimeter around it, and the ranger's job was to prevent the crowd of 70,000 people from getting too close to the effigy when it was on fire, because it's obviously a huge hazard. And so Aaron, Justin, and their friends, when they got to this clearing and saw the effigy, they would have seen thousands and thousands of event attendees converging Holy on shit. this effigy, getting as close to the rangers as they possibly could on all sides. And so Aaron and Justin and their friends, they make their way up to one particular section of this crowd, and they begin fighting their way through all these people, trying to get as close to the rangers as they possibly could, because they want a good view of this man burn. And then once they were satisfied with their view, they just stopped and waited for the effigy to be lit. But before the effigy was lit, Aaron would turn to Justin and say, hey, I have some friends from Switzerland who are here right now. They're on the other side of the effigy, on the other side of the crowd, and I'm gonna go see them right now. And so Justin was totally bummed that Aaron was gonna be leaving right before this thing is lit because he wanted to experience this with Aaron. Travis Scott said, should okay, have no taken problem. notes you know, and picked the venue that you know, before this thing gets lit, or you know, I'll see <clears throat> after this burn. It wouldn't have mattered. And so Aaron departed the group, and Justin watched as he kind of disappeared into the crowd. And then Justin turned his attention back towards the effigy. And a little while later, when the sun had gone down and it was totally dark out and the crowd was totally electric as they're waiting for this thing to light, finally they did. They lit the effigy. And as soon as it went up in flames, the crowd of thousands oh, and thousands no. of people roared with excitement. And this whole time, Justin is totally amazed by. Dude, that's like, he definitely, he definitely was, he was proud, yeah. They did, they lit the effigy. Dear Lord, that's like an explosion.
energy. And as soon as it went up in flames, the crowd of thousands and thousands of people roared with excitement. And this whole time, Justin is totally amazed by what he is watching, but he's also scanning the crowd, kind of hoping that Aaron will eventually pop back up. But at this point, the crowd is so massive and everyone's so tight together that Justin is really not expecting Aaron to come back over to where he had been. I thought it was going to be a gradual part. lighting. And so this huge wooden I didn't think it'd be an explosion. In glorious flames and everyone's so amazed by it. And then eventually the flames begin to dwindle down as the structure continues to burn lower and lower to the ground. And then finally, when the fire is just about out, the crowd of people begin to disperse. <laughs> and at this point, Justin again looks around hoping to maybe see Aaron, but you know, Aaron has not come back yet. And so Justin just says, okay, you know, maybe it's time to leave and go check in he with fell Aaron asleep. at the van. And so he notifies his friends that he's he going to turn fell around asleep and on back. the ground. And as Justin turns and begins leaving the crowd, someone who was at the event, who apparently knew Justin and knew Aaron, came running over to Justin and frantically told him this totally shocking story about something that happened to Aaron. Now, at first, Justin just could not believe it. He couldn't even process it. It seemed so outlandish and unbelievable that it just could not have happened. But he was thinking to himself, you know, I haven't seen Aaron since he left to go see his friends from Switzerland, okay. and I have no idea where he is. And so Come Justin on. starts looking around the crowd again. He's not seeing Aaron. Come he's on. starting to panic. I want to so know. Finally, Justin just turns and starts running back towards his van in hopes that Aaron is going to be there. But when he gets back to his van, Aaron is not there, and there's no sign that Aaron has been back after they had left for the man burn. What it was the story? That shocking story Justin had been told about Aaron was true. <clears throat> this. What was the story? story. Okay. After Aaron told Justin that he was going to go to the other side of the crowd and spend some time with his friends from Switzerland, he disappeared from the group and he made his way over to that far side of the crowd. But we don't know if he actually met up with friends from Switzerland or if that was just some cover to get away from Justin and the other people he was with. But regardless, at some point, Aaron made his way over to the other side of the effigy, away from Justin and away from his other friends. And once he was over there, he pushed his way towards the front of the crowd until he was right in front of the rangers with front row seats of the effigy. And then after the effigy was set alight and was fully engulfed in flames, Aaron, at some point, bum-rushed one of the rangers right in front of him and was able to push past him. And then before that ranger or any other nearby rangers could stop him, Aaron was able to sprint directly into the bottom of this massive effigy, right into the fire, and he disappeared inside of it. Because the crowd was massive and unruly and many people were under the influence of Why? drugs or alcohol or both, because of all of that, even though Aaron is running into the fire right in front of them, it was like nobody noticed. Everybody was in kind of their own worlds and it's dark out, there's this fire. I mean, there's so many distractions that really nobody noticed this happening besides Why? the rangers that were immediately <clears throat> affected by Aaron running past That's them. That's metal and as some fuck. some of the people that were right at the he front definitely of the committed crowd die. watching as Aaron did this. And so this is why Justin and the rest of his friends had no idea this had happened, despite the fact they were watching this fire as this was happening. Aaron would ultimately only be inside of the flames for 12 seconds before the rangers were able to go inside and pull him out. But by that time, it was already too late. Aaron would be rushed to the hospital, but he would die that night. It would later be determined that Aaron was completely sober at the time he decided to run into the burning man, which means he, he was, was a big clear fan of the band when disturbed. he decided to do this. And so it was determined that his death had to be a suicide. I mean, there's got to be, you know, less painful ways to do it, man. You know, I mean, I don't think picking the most painful way to die is the best way to go. There's thousands of options, dude. Way less painful. Like, think about the pain he went through for that. Could have a pain kink. <clears throat> Are you condoning suicide? No, I'm, this is, what do you mean? This is hindsight for the guy who already committed suicide. I'm talking to the dude who's already dead. It's confusing. Make a statement, but what statement? There's no statement to be made. <laughs> what? All the level-headed suicidal people, you know what I mean? What do you mean level-headed suicide people? You know, depression doesn't mean you're insane. What?
Depression doesn't mean you want to run into a fire. Cringe. Thank you, Alex Rod, for the prime. None of these people made good life decisions true. Well, they turned it into a real Burning Man. However, his family and his friends and anybody <clears throat> who knew him are just totally not buying the idea that he decided to commit suicide, especially like this. It just didn't make any sense. This is not something Aaron would have done. He was acting totally normally. His behavior... Why is there a Barbie doll in his pants? ...here was not erratic. Something else must have caused this to happen. But unfortunately, at this point, no one has come close to figuring out what this other thing could be. And so to date, his death still remains largely a mystery. Here is a picture one of the bystanders took of Aaron as he charges into the fire. Oh my god. So that's gonna do- What the fuck? That's scary, dude. Wow. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments section what it is and where you found it. So give us the timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we'll pin you at the top of the comment. See, what I thought was going to happen, chat, what I thought was going to happen was he was going to try to run across the Burning Man thing just to make it quicker to get to his friends. And then, like, by the time he ran past, it blows up and kills him. That's what I thought was going to happen. Now it's time to walk away. I hope you enjoyed your stay. Did you laugh or cry or maybe subscribe? I'll thank you either way. You know I will miss you. Turn. Tell your friend or your mother to get me more views, please.